When you read about African history and African dictators, some of the most common names that come up are Idi Amin of Uganda, John Bodel Bokasa of the Central African Republic, Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe, amongst others. But little is known and discussed about Equatorial Guinea's most brutal dictator, known as Francisco Macias Ngema. Francisco Macias Ngema is by far the worst dictator Africa has ever seen. The founding president of Equatorial Guinea was post-independence Africa's most ruthless, bloody dictator and economic vandal. Masia Singema's iron fist rule, mass murder, economic plunder and crazy behavior even made his wife to flee in 1976. And during his reign, Equatorial Guinea was a byword for a hermit country of political murders and non-existent economy. You see, Equatorial Guinea was colonized by the Spanish and they achieved independence in October 1968 with Francisco Masia Singema as its first president. The president was less educated, whereby on three occasions he even failed to pass examinations qualifying him for civil service. He only passed the fourth as a result of overt Spanish favoritism. This led him to develop an inferiority complex that turned out to a hatred of intellectuals and educated people, so bitter that he later banned the word intellectual. He got plenty of names for himself. For example, he was known as the Pol Pot of Africa due to his actions after a Cambodian dictator. His 11-year reign was dubbed the Dachau of Africa after a Nazi concentration camp that used gas to kill millions of Jews in the Second World War. Macias was extremely anti-Spain and never disguised the fact that he was a tribal supremacist. He harbored intense resentment against foreign culture and intellectuals in general. In February 1969, while on a visit to the village of Bata, he found Spanish flags still flying in the area, which triggered his rage. He used this as an opportunity to seek vigency against the Spaniards through his inflammatory and provocative speeches, which triggered youth activists to go out to the streets searching for Spanish victims. Now, as a result, the Spaniards fled the country fearing for their safety. By the end of March, most of the Spanish population of about 7,000, including civil service administrators, teachers, technicians, and shopkeepers had fled the country, abandoning their businesses, properties, and prosperous farms. The incident led to the murder of a foreign minister who tried to intervene to diffuse the situation. Scores of politicians and other people whom Ungema wanted out of the way were killed too, including a former ambassador who met his death through a brutal manner where he was repeatedly immersed in a water barrel for a week. The dictator became paranoid of being taken out of power. As a result, the country fell into a jump of murder and mayhem. Ten out of the twelve ministers in his first government were executed and replaced by members of his own family and fellow tribesmen that he could trust. So it's common for African dictators to surround and appoint family members friends and tribesmen in order to entrench themselves in political power, and Marcius was no different. Notably of all his appointments is the current president of Equatorial Guinea, Colonel Todao Obiang Basogo, who became the commander of the National Guard, the military commander, the secretary general of the Ministry of Defense, and the head of prisons. See, originally Marcius drew his officials mainly from his tribe known as the Fang, but as paranoia grew, he filled all positions with his immediate clan, the Nsangui. In fact, it is his extended family became the state. He appointed most of his nephews to senior security positions, and on one occasion, a nephew held multiple portfolios in security, trade, information, and state enterprises. A cousin ran for foreign affairs. Officers in the security forces were all linked to Ngema by ties of kinship. The brutal dictator declared himself the grandmaster of science, education, and culture, and launched a purge and vengeance against educated classes and intellectuals and took savage reprisals against any hint of opposition. Whereas other African countries were looking to educate their people and sending them abroad for scholarships, in Equatorial Guinea it was a crime to be educated. Majority of the people were executed or exiled for being educated. He waged a war on intellectuals whom he cited as the greatest problem facing Africa today and claimed that the educated classes were polluting our climate with foreign culture. 
By the end of his reign, only two doctors and fewer than a dozen of technical school graduates remained in the country. He declared private education subversive and banned it. Two-thirds of the National Assembly deputies were killed, imprisoned or forced into exile. When the director of statistics published a demographic estimate that Ingema considered to be too low, he was mutilated to help him learn to count. In two documented cases, he ordered the execution of all his former lovers of his current mistresses and ordered the murder of all husbands of women he coveted. Before each state visit, Ngema made abroad, political prisoners were routinely killed to dissuade opponents from conspiring against him. In 1976, 114 civil servants that were picked by Ngema to replace the ones he had previously murdered petitioned to relax the country's total isolation, thinking they would be safe due to their numbers. Every one of the petitioners was arrested, tortured, and never to be seen again. Branding himself the national miracle or the unique miracle, Equatorial Guinea had neither a development plan nor an accounting system for public funds. The central bank was closed after Ngema killed the governor in 1976 and carried whatever remained in the national treasury to his rural village house. He, when he ran short of money, he ransomed foreigners. 57,600 US dollars for a German woman, 40,000 US dollars for a Spanish professor, and 7,000 dollars for a deceased Soviet citizen. See, by then, Equatorial Guinea relied more on cocoa and fishing industries, but even these ones ceased to be operational. He banned all Western medicine, claiming it to be an African which enabled the resurgence of diseases that garnered Equatorial Guinea, the nickname the Death's Waiting Room. For a predominantly Roman Catholic country, churches and priests were not spared. Marcius ordered them to praise him in their sermons. Those who refused were either killed, tortured, or exiled. Christian names were banned, teachers were sacked, and schools closed. He created a cult personality and declared himself the national miracle or the unique miracle, and ordered that at the end of Mass, the congregation should shout chants like, Forward with Marcius, always with Marcius, never without Marcius. There is no God other than Marcius. God created Equatorial Guinea thanks to Papa Marcius. In 1974 to 1975, he banned all religious meetings, funerals, and sermons, and forbade the use of all Christian names. To encourage the use of traditional African medicines, Marcius fired doctors and nurses and shut down hospitals. When people fled the country by water, to avoid escape, he destroyed all boats and mined all the roads. His thugs killed Nigerian immigrant workers in the cocoa plantations who demanded higher wages and badly beat up members of Nigeria's diplomatic mission in the capital Malabo. In 1976, Nigeria had to repatriate all its citizens from Equatorial Guinea. To replace them, Marcius ordered the forced recruitment of 2,500 males from each of the country's 10 districts causing an exodus of tens of thousands to neighboring Gabon and Cameroon. Ngema exhibited signs of overt paranoid madness with disjointed conversations and ideas. His movements were often jerky and uncoordinated. He became progressively deaf, shouting out loudly in order to hear himself. Amidst all this, he refused to use hearing aids, claiming they were Western. Marcia's father divorced his mind from reality, by routinely smoking marijuana and drinking iboga, a traditional hallucinogen with effects similar to LSD. Towards the end of his reign, he retreated to his native remote village in Mongomo, where he took with him most of the national treasury, storing huge wads of bills in bags and suitcases in a bamboo hut next to his house. He kept the country's pharmaceutical store there as well. Many Guineans believed that he was endowed with supernatural powers, you see, his father was a sorcerer who was feared amongst his tribesmen, the Fang and the Nsangui clan. So Ngema used his knowledge of traditional witchcraft to prop up his legitimacy and to keep the local population in submission and fear. He invented plots, then uncovered them in order to prove his invincibility. By 1979, even the close associates of Ngema had realized that he was mad and lost faith in him. Uh, this came when a visibly deranged Marcius executed members of his own family. The ruling clan was shocked, and one lieutenant colonel, a nephew of Matthias, whose brother was among the executed, organized a coup, and on August 3, 1979, Matthias was overthrown. Matthias tried to bolt, but he was later captured, and a debate arose whether to put him on trial or in a psychiatric ward. The family decided on a trial, 
which was held on September 1979 on charges of genocide and embezzlement of public funds. Out of the 80,000 murders listed in the original indictment, he was found guilty of 500 counts that didn't implicate other perpetrators. Fearful of his supernatural powers, no local soldier was willing to participate in the firing squad, so the task was given to a group of Moroccan soldiers. The number of people that died in the 11-year rule of Marcius Ngema are estimated between 50,000 to 80,000 people, which is proportionally much worse than the Nazi-occupied Europe. For a population of 384,000 people, two-thirds of the population was wiped out by the reign of Francis Marcius Ngema. Thank you very much for listening.